Morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Mark Thompson. Um, my background uh, and the reason I get so excited about this agenda is uh, background originally in engineering at Rolls-Royce and Bentley and Crew, uh, what is now Bentley and Crew. So I'm an automotive engineer underneath, a petrol head underneath. I still have a guilty V8 secret in the garage that doesn't come out very often, but that's, a, that's for another day. Um, and the reason I'm passionate about this agenda is it connects with my automotive background and the fact that I'm passionate about climate change and trying to address it uh, and my career is focused around energy and decarbonisation for the last 10 years or so. So this ticks every box that I have um, and is why I'm, I'm so passionate about it. So um, this talks about electric vehicles and, and some, some evidence-based facts um, and information about what it's like to own and, and use an electric vehicle and a little bit about myths and how to debust some myths that are out there um, in, in the next three quarters of an hour or so. Um, and the other reason I get uh, particularly excited about this agenda as well is that I also own an EV. I've had one for six and a half years. This is my second one. I've had it eight, uh, about a year now. I bought it 18 months old. Um, it's got a sort of medium size uh, battery. Uh, certainly a lot bigger than they used to be, but in the scale of what's coming, uh, I would say it's a medium-sized battery with a range of 172 miles uh, quoted maximum range. And I have actually achieved that. Uh, it took a bit of doing, had to really concentrate for the 172, but I have actually done that uh, day to day, 120, 130, 140 miles range is pretty easy, easily achievable as long as you don't drive like an idiot. So uh, that also compounds my interest in the agenda in that I've got one of these wonderful toys and uh, and I will happily uh, fly the flag for it with any audience going. So the reason for um, electric vehicle, uh, the, the importance of electric vehicles and decarbonization agenda is if you take a breakdown of the uh, challenges that we've got in UK emissions and reducing them, transport is, uh, as you can see from the blue area there, a little over a quarter of our um, our total emissions uh, as a nation. Um, out of that, uh, the vast majority of that, over 90% is road transport. And then if you break that down further, passenger cars are 62% uh, of, of that road transport component of the transport emissions. So um, road Passenger vehicles, if you if you work the, the numbers of all that out and ratio that down, <clears throat> passenger vehicles equate to uh, about 18 or so percent of the uh, of the nation's carbon footprint. Uh, and so it's a very important uh, and, e and, and relatively easy thing to address in terms of uh, helping the nation decarbonize through moving from petrol and diesel vehicles to, um, to electrified vehicles, um, including full electric vehicles as well as plug-ins. So it's very important uh, for both a decarbonization point of view, but also air quality as well, of course, because of um, you know, emissions from, um, from uh, the combustion of, of petrol and, and diesel. So a little bit of basics about an EV, plug-in plug -in cars, hybrid cars, just a few diagrams here to help people who aren't particularly car, particularly car savvy understand um, what the, these terms mean. So one expression that's been around many years now since uh, the introduction of the Prius in uh, what 2005 or six or wherever it was, is, is the term a hybrid vehicle. So a hybrid vehicle um, there have been a number of uh, variants of hybrid vehicles around for over well over a decade. Um, and the format for that is where you have a conventional, uh, usually petrol engine, um, but it's also got an electric motor uh, sort of dovetailed into the, into the drivetrain to provide uh, traction when the vehicle is at low speed, such as stop start or local driving. And that has a fairly small battery. Um, so you might get you know, 10 or 15 miles out of a, a hybrid vehicle, but they do vary enormously. Um, and the, the vehicle is, is self-contained from the point of view of its energy source in that it gets all of its power from petrol or in some cases diesel. So it is a, it's basically a petrol car with a small battery that, uh, that intervenes occasionally for extra power or low, or low speed local running. Um, these are also known um, more recently by advertising from Toyota as self-charging hybrids, which is trying to trying to create the impression that they are better than a plug-in hybrid um, from, from a marketing perspective. Uh, it's a little bit of a con. Uh, ultimately, all of the energy from a hybrid vehicle comes from uh, petrol. 
um, albeit some of the energy from going downhill is recaptured by regenerative braking. So they are self-contained, petrol in, diesel in, um, and, and all of the energy ultimately comes from uh, fossil fuels. So the, the Toyota uh, advertising is seen as seen by many in the industry as, and as misleading, albeit uh, technically correct. So that's a hybrid. Uh, then we have uh, plug-in hybrids, which are very much the same format with a conventional drivetrain with a conventional, relatively conventional uh, petrol or diesel engine. Uh, an electric motor, of course, uh, built into it, similar to a normal hybrid, but the battery is usually larger um, to give you a, a greater range on electric only, sort of 30 miles, 40 miles, perhaps in some cases, and for local running. Um, and the uh, the key difference here is that a plug-in hybrid allows you to plug the vehicle into the into the, the power grid to charge the battery up. So you're you're shifting from a vehicle uh, that's wholly fossil fuel powered to uh, one now where a proportion of the, en the energy for, for, for propelling the car is from, um, is from electricity. And I do know people who hardly ever um, need the, the petrol or diesel engine to, to, to run. They've got very local um, uses of the vehicle, uh, limited, limited distances for most of their journeys and in, in those cases most of their energy uh, comes from uh, the power grid and it's obviously the lowest uh, from the point of view of emissions carbon and uh, and running costs as well and then the third variant uh, the the full battery electric vehicle is, is quite a different animal really um, in many ways it's a, it's a conventional car from all the sort of conventional engineering point of view of body and braking system, et cetera, et cetera, um, and, and body features, et cetera, and comfort features. But it, the, under the bonnet, it's 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 a, an electric motor, uh, a very large electric motor, but it is essentially just an electric motor um, and uh, a much larger battery to give you your full, uh, your full journey usability. So those two categories on the right are referred to collectively as plug-in. So a plug-in vehicle can be either a battery electric vehicle, a BEV, or it can be a plug-in hybrid. Um, so the electric vehicle market is a very unusual one. It's a completely different um, uh, way of engineering cars. And obviously there are confidence issues in both investing in the technology from the user point of view and the manufacturer point of view. And in terms of projecting what the growth of the sector will be worldwide, or, or even on a country basis, it's extremely hard to do. So there are many, many, many sort of fan charts like this that try to give an idea of what the what the penetration and the take up of electric or plug-in plug vehicles will be. Um, there's one um, automotive executive in the US who who described the, the growth of electric vehicles as trying to get uh, ketchup out of a ketchup bottle. Uh, you keep banging the back of the bottle and you don't know how much will come out or when, um, but you know it will come out eventually. And, and that's how they, they sort of describe this particular market and this particular transition. And I think that's a pretty fair comparison, although the evidence now is, is starting to indicate that the, the, the ketchup is coming. Mark, we have yes. a question from Steve Carpenter. What, Hello. Happened, what happened to hydrogen fuel cell EVs? Um, there are some on the market. They are very expensive. Uh, the infrastructure to provide uh, hydrogen for those vehicles is phenomenally expensive, um, and we don't have a uh, a mass a mass available low cost way of providing um, decarbonized hydrogen either. So, in in the vehicle sense, from the point of view of what the vehicle does, yes, putting hydrogen in and only getting water out is a very elegant solution. But the infrastructure to deliver or provide hydrogen is is really expensive and and it will always be much it will always be a lot more expensive to run a hydrogen vehicle than it will be to run an electric vehicle it, that's that's uh, the, the general take on it um so uh, there are there are a few on the market but they're only sold in in penny numbers um and and it, it's seen that the growth of battery electric vehicles is, is going so well and the engineering and the, and the technology development on the battery side is going so well that I don't believe hydrogen will ever really have a role for, for most applications, certainly not our, in our sorts of usages in, in, in passenger vehicles um, uh, in, in, in the future at all. I think it will be for niche applications and for heavy industry and for heavy vehicles. Thank you. 
So um, the UK position on electric vehicles is really, really encouraging. So if you think about the previous sort of fan chart, um, you know, crystal ball gazing, this is the reality um, of sales of both battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles in the UK. Um, this year was an unusual year um, in that uh, obviously petrol and diesel car sales plummeted with COVID in, in sort of April, May, but actually bet battery battery vehicle sales actually held up really, really well. And so the proportion of UK sales now that are battery vehicle is sort of over 5%, 5.5%. Uh, if you look at the year to, year to date position uh, and plug-in hybrids is over 3%. So in totality, we're pushing towards 9% of um, new car sales now are on, on a year to date basis for 2020 are, are plug-in vehicles which is really, really encouraging. There's some more stats to show you in a moment. Um, so uh, again, year to date, uh, diesel sales, 210,000, very much down on last year, as you can see from the, the 2019 column, uh, battery vehicle sales and, and plug-in hybrid sales. In total there um, are uh, sort of 110 or so thousand cars, again, significantly up from 2019. Um, and if you look at across all of the battery electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid, the, the ones below there are all sort of hybrid hybrid variants. Those are all vehicles with batteries. And if you add all those figures up, that's 314,000 vehicles sold in the UK this year that, that have got a battery in them, which means they've got an automatic gearbox. Uh, so we're moving away from manual gearbox to auto. Uh, people are getting the experience of an electric experience in all of those cases, whether they're at slow speed or maneuvering or stop start traffic. So there's a transition there in terms of user experiences. And in, in totality, that's that's obviously, you know, 50% more vehicles on the road now selling with a, with a battery in them than, than, than we're selling diesels, which is really, really encouraging. So that the, the tide is turning. And then the other statistic I just want to draw out on here is that all of these um, battery-based vehicles or battery-inclusive um, uh, um, vehicles are on the up in terms of the, the sales, uh, both uh, real-term sales and percentage of the market sales in the UK. So, so there are changes afoot that I think spell really good for the positive future for the EV uh, market as a whole. Uh, international comparisons, people may have heard of Norway uh, is doing great stuff with EVs. They have significantly incentivize the sale of EVs, uh, free parking, use of um, lanes on motorways that would be toll otherwise, uh, lots and lots of incentives. Um, and the figures for last year there, you see Norway is a percentage of sales, over half of the vehicles were, um, were, were plug-in vehicles. Uh, and the UK is in what not sort of 10th position or so. So uh, that's how we compare to, to other countries within Europe. Um, USA is very low, as you can see, down to 1.93% at the bottom there. Um, I forget where China is, but China, in terms of numbers of sales, is very high. But the interesting perspective here is that there is there is growth in all these areas. On a, on a country basis, they are all growing. Uh, and just to take Norway as a specific example again, um, the chart on the left I showed you is 2019. If you look at 2020, uh, it's actually increased in terms of the proportion of vehicles now on, on um, that are plug-in uh, in Norway that are sold each year is is over 75%. So it's gone up from 55% last year to over 75% uh, plug-in vehicles in Norway, of which three quarters are full electric. And and you think about the the domain in Norway, the, ge the geographical challenges of, of how big the country is, the rural rural nature of it, the, the long distances, the cold weather, and it's not putting people off. And, and if you go, you talk to anyone in Norway, they say, well, you know, f forget the incentives. We, people recognize now they're better cars and, the, and they want to move to them and they want to buy them. They see it's a logical thing to do. Can I, uh, can I just say, I, did, I talked to a Norwegian who yeah. told me that initially they'd been able to do it because they had no indigenous car manufacturers. Yes, that's true. What, what they did was put 100% tax on all the car imports, which was all of them if they were brand new, yeah. uh, unless they were electric. Yeah. So it cost you half as much, and that got the ball rolling. 
yeah they obviously yeah, they didn't have a home as you say didn't have a home manufacturer that they were going to hurt <laughs> so they're, they're they're quite fortunate to have that that weakness yeah. if you like yeah. in terms of their industrial um base so yeah uh, so it's a fantastic success story over there and i was in oslo a couple of years ago in fact and and evs were absolutely everywhere um car parks dedicated to evs um astonishing um a real buzz and it sort of gave me a flavor as to what the uk could be like um so moving on to uh, the uk and how it's how evs are seen um my father-in-law gets his magazine so i get piles of them secondhand from him and evs plug-in hybrids hybrids are featured far in excess of the proportion of, of sales at the moment um, they're on front covers on almost every edition they're reviewed in there alongside petrol and diesel cars. So you will have a Nissan Leaf compared to a Vauxhall Astra diesel. And they'll have a, a you know road test and they'll compare the two. So it's not like they're treating EVs as this special category in the back of the magazine that the, that's these weird, weird, weird things on the road. They are absolutely seen as the exciting place to be. Uh, and they excite people and interest people who aren't traditionally car interested or car orientated. Um, so they capture the imagination of the general public uh, beyond the traditional base of people that were interested in, you know, what was under the bonnet. Um, this chart is fantastic. Unfortunately, there isn't a more up to date one, but it, it gives a flavor for the explosion in models that are coming in terms of EV uh, models that are coming on the market in the years ahead. So I can't find a more up to date one, which is a real shame because it's it would be far more populous than this. Um, but there are there are dozens and dozens and dozens of cars coming. All all the, the major motor manufacturers now are embracing EVs. Even Ford, at last, are getting getting serious about it. They all recognise that they have to do this, um, and that people love driving them, and they have to respond because ultimately they are cheaper vehicles to run and more enjoyable vehicles to drive. But it's becoming really exciting. It's not just your Nissan Leaf and your BMW i3 and your Tesla anymore. There, there is already now a very wide range of cars and, and there's a lot more coming, including low, low price ones. So where we are, I think, um, in terms of the timeline for electric vehicle development and, and the usability and drivability and battery and all that sort of stuff, if you think about where mobile phones were, you know, going back in the in the mid 2000s, you know, we'd had the sort of bricks going down to sort of small keypad phones. And then suddenly things started to swing and become very exciting with touchscreens and, 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 uh, and the smarter devices and so on. I think EVs now, we're in that sort of point where we've, you know, the, the, the basics are proven. The technology is shown to be robust. There's a very exciting future coming. Uh, and I think, you know, whatever people's preconceptions or real world experiences are or, or anecdotes that they've heard about current EVs on the market, it will only get better. It will only get more interesting. Um, uh, the cars will only get cheaper. They will only improve in terms of range uh, and driving experience and, and charging experience. It's we're in for a future that's going to be really, really slick and easy and 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 very uh very very plentiful of choice as well in the future for for this particular domain um certainly i still hear people occasionally refer to them as grown-up milk floats they are absolutely not they are extremely sophisticated well-engineered uh, very drivable cars so real world experience from my point of view and and drawing in sort of what i see in the media and, and talking to other owners and and so on and so on um i say so i used to work for rolls royce bentley i used to drive um, the cars as an engineer, and I have to say, it's it's you know, my, my Nissan Leaf. It's as quiet and smooth as driving the role as I used to drive back in the in the uh, late late nineties, a long time ago now. Uh, it it really is. You you hear very very little, a little bit of wind noise, a little bit of tire noise, um, and that's it. It's the very very sublime place to be. Um, and I do also you know, like to say it's it's like having a bath and driving at the same time. And if you're in traffic, stop, start traffic. You know, it is just a very nice, comfortable, cozy place, easy place just to sit there and, 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 and you know, not enjoy the traffic, but make the most of it and just have a very, very, very relaxing way of being stuck in traffic. So, you know, you've got one pedal basically, you know, on off pedal on the right hand side with your accelerator. You do have a brake, but you don't need to use it very often. So it's extraordinarily relaxing to drive one of these. So you find yourself driving slower than you would a conventional car on the motorway. My wife and I just set the, set the cruise at 60 miles an hour. And we're happy, you know, it's, it's just lovely. It's a lot, that's a lot slower than I used to, to, to cruise up. It's just nice to be like that. 
Um, other things from my point of view are the running costs are as cheap as running one of these things. Um, the average cost of servicing for my car is around about £150 a year. I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, and also, it's fun. It's fun creeping around car parks in silence. It's fun pulling up in my drive, my parents' driveway when I'm allowed uh, with COVID. It's fun pulling up in my driver's parents' driveway and they can't hear me coming and the dog can't hear us coming. And the, the first thing they know is when we're knocking on the door. So they're a lot of fun and they're also a lot of fun at the lights because they, they, they are very nimble with instant acceleration and uh, driving them is, is a lot of fun on the open road. Uh, Everybody loves them that drives them. Um, people very rarely walk back from having owned or, or driven an EV and want to go back to a petrol diesel car. Uh, Auto Express's driver satisfaction survey in 2016 had, uh, across all cars, had uh, EVs as the top two. That's that's fallen away now. The, the novelty's worn off a little bit, but people absolutely love them. And, and, and indeed, if you talk to hybrid hybrid drivers, most hybrid drivers love them. Uh, you know, taxi drivers all love their Priuses. So it's a very, very enjoyable, very rewarding, uh, very um, in, uh, uh, fun driving experience. So um, there are some frustrations, uh, real and perceived, I think. So this is my take on those. So people say, I've got to download all these apps to be able to charge my car. Well, certainly if you can charge at home, uh, life is a lot easier. We, we, we've got a, you know, we've got a driveway so we can charge uh, at home. And most of our charging, the vast majority of our charging is at home, which is the cheapest way to do it. Um, and we, we do a charge occasionally on a long trip. We've been down to Bristol a few times and down to Oxford a few times. So we, we probably charge once a month using pub public infrastructure. I think we've got three apps for three different mobile operators. Um, we do find it a bit of a pain trying to remember how to use the app because we're not regular users, but the experience will be getting better and better. Uh, and, and now they're moving away from the necess necessity for apps. Uh, there is now contactless payment capabilities now on, on a number of the charges, and that will come. Um, so that's a bit of a pain, but you certainly don't need to, to, to have dozens of apps. Um, two to three covers most, most sorts of common journeys you might have if you're an infrequent uh, EV user. And if you're somebody that, sorry, inf infrequent uh, public charging user, and if you're someone that um, doesn't have home charging and needs to use public infrastructure all the time. Of course, you'll very quickly you know, remember what your app does. You'll get sort of muscle memory on and how to use your app, and and um, uh, it'll be you know without done without thinking about it uh, for people that do it regularly. Uh, other sort of some frustrations are there's all these different connector types. Well, there are a number of different connectors, but once you recognize visually what yours is and what the name of it is, um, you know, there are three or four different connectors for different types of phones. Um, you just remember, oh, that's mine. And and you and you plug them at the, the respective one in accordingly. So it is a bit bamboozling to begin with. Um, but yeah, very quickly, you sort of you know, soon remember which, which is yours. Um, one of the frustrations that I've never directly experienced, but it does happen from time to time, is petrol or diesel vehicles parking in an EV charging bay. Uh, I've seen it occasionally out and about, but it's never happened to me when I've needed to charge, nor indeed have I ever waited to charge any more than a few minutes. So inconsiderate users doing this um, does happen. It drives EV users nuts, quite rightly. It's extremely inconsiderate. Um, but interestingly, it doesn't happen in Norway because the social values and attitudes to use of uh, EVs um, and the respect for others' needs is different. Um, but it does happen here. Um, but as EV charging infrastructure becomes more prevalent uh, and people's acceptance, that this is a, an, an unacceptable issue grows. I think this will die out in time with, with a bit of luck, but it does happen. Uh, and then this is a personal one from me. Uh, many EV owners probably don't experience this, but it's only really if you're going somewhere new to charge on a route you've never been before and you know there's an EV charging point in a car park somewhere, sometimes it is a bit frustrating finding it. It can be stuck in a corner or it could be somewhere very prominent. Um, the, the EV chargers themselves are made by different manufacturers and different networks, so they look different, they're labeled differently. Um, so sometimes, you know, on one or two occasions, one of us has resorted to walking around the car park looking for it. Um, but in, in general, just driving around, pootling around a car park for a minute or two and you find it. So it's just it's an annoyance rather than anything else, purely because uh, there isn't any local signage in many cases saying EV charges this way. 
Um, but that's that's probably a personal gripe. I'm not sure how widespread that one is, but it's it just makes my makes me my blood boil a little bit sometimes. I just I get a good moment. So um, non-obvious uh, perspectives, non-obvious benefits. Um, first of all, I think every EV or plug-in vehicle on the road, uh, if you need to, you can plug it with a, you can charge it with a three-pin plug. They call it a granny lead. You, most cars come with a granny lead, so you can visit a relation who hasn't got EV charging infrastructure. Uh, or if you're stuck, you can plug in someone's house and you can you can charge it. It's slow. It's it works out at about eight eight miles range per every hour of charge. But if you're you know if you're low on juice and you just need a tiny amount to get you to another an, an EV charging point, it it's it's a godsend. We've never had to use it. Um, no, no, we used it once. One of my relatives we visited once. We did use it, but we plan to use it. Um, so you can. There is always that backup of a three-pin plug. Um, you can set the car and control it remotely to defrost in winter. So uh, you know the conventional thing of leaving a petrol or diesel car running to defrost outside the house and worrying about it being stolen. You don't have any issue with an EV. You just set it. You just remotely turn it on, uh, and it will defrost and, and happily warm the car up and in some cases, it'll put the heated seats on and all that sort of stuff. And in summer, similarly, you can turn it on to cool the car down before you get into it um, with 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 a negligible amount of uh, of uh, usage of the battery, I have to say as well. So you will, you're you not going to flatten the battery. It doesn't need to take a tiny amount uh, in relative terms to do this. Um, you don't get black wheels. Um, I've had alloy wheels on a few cars over the last few years, um, and they get black with brake dust. The brake dust eats into the alloy. Uh, paint um, it's not very nice to try and clean off and you don't get it at all with regen braking uh, or virtually not at all uh, so you end up with lovely wheels that stay in good condition and they're easier to clean um, and the last one is um, they are pretty nimble um, you know the north 60s are pretty pretty good for all of them and very very good for some of them um, but they're very nimble away from the junction and and for overtaking you simply have instantaneous power Service items, um, there are only four things, really. Um, windscreen wipers, you know, a pollen filter, uh, tyres naturally, um, and I would say tyre wear is no different to any other car. Um, and like any car, uh, brake fluid needs to be changed every 18 months, two years, um, because it's hydrophobic, uh, hydroscopic, I should say. Um, but, but that's it. There's no oil to change. My first Leaf had done 60,000 when I sold it. It was on its original brake pads all around and original discs all around. And it was probably good for another 30 or 40,000 miles. So I reckon the brakes are good for 100,000, the conventional brakes. Um, so no air filter, no spark plugs, no none of that. So the, the, the service check sheet for it, um, when it when it goes in is basically a, li a tick list of checks which are mainly safety checks so the 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 actual consumables are teeny teeny tiny and you get a nice buzz every year uh, with your uh, vehicle excise duty uh, notification which is zero so you get even though it's zero you still get one of these it gives you that uh, gives you a lovely smug feeling when you see it um you can all you have to do is say yes the car's still on the road it's not sawned um, but that's a nice little feel-good factor you get once a year as a little uh, hidden perk. Um, so uh, where will people charge? Um, so I hear questions sometimes, uh, you know, what will be the best charging solution for me or for everyone as a whole? Um, and don't we just need an EV that can be charged like a fossil fuel car, a car, you know, an EV that you can connect up and it can be fully charged in three or four or five minutes? Um, so, so these are some of the questions that, you, that, that people do have in their minds. Uh, but actually, there are many, many reasons of diversity, drivers of diversity, um, that will that, that actually will, will create a need and, and very good rationale for lots of different solutions. So first of all, if you want to if you want to charge your car very quickly, it will require a lot of power. Um, that power will have a premium in terms of the infrastructure that will re be required to deliver it. Um, and the time of day that, that you might want that might not be good for the grid. Um, so it's, it's expensive to do. So if you want the convenience of being able to charge really quickly, uh, it will cost you. It will be more per mile, quite a bit more per, per mile than, than you know, trickle charging at home. Um, and if you do trickle charge at home or you plug in on a, on a you know, 
on a lower power bit of the charging infrastructure, there are rewards for helping the grid. You can have cheaper energy uh, for your EV at different times of day. Uh, different weather conditions might mean different pricing. Sometimes pricing can be negative, so you could be paid to plug in and charge. So having an EV plugged into the wall um, with some smart systems to help decide on charging strategy is a really clever thing to do. Um, and then there are many things that will affect people's preferences, such as attitudes, vehicle use patterns, where they park it, whether they've got on or off, off street parking, et cetera, et cetera. And the battery size. If you've got a large battery, you don't need it charging every day, every few days. Um, you know, we charge a couple of times a week. Um, so there is no silver bullet. There is no one size fits all. And here's some, some personal examples of this. So this is my, um, my uh, family. Uh, I can't name them for GDPR reasons, but I've got two brothers and parents. Um, I've got one brother who understands the need for all this, doesn't care, uh, and he has other priorities. Um, I've got another brother who doesn't really understand the need, doesn't care, and he's uh, mean. And I've got parents who are sort of circa 80-ish, um, and the you know, traditional uh, uh, outlook on the world. Uh, they're not sure what the fuss is all about, but they can see I'm excited by it. Uh, and they still buy 100-watt light bulbs. And the charging solutions for these these three um, lovely uh, uh, members of my family are uh, going to be quite different. So come the day that brother one eventually gets an EV, it will be workplace charging will appeal to him, I would think, knowing him and occasional use of rapids. Um, my other brother uh, will probably want it to be plugged in with a vehicle to grid system or something that means he can get value from his solar panels. So that will be the solution that will work best for him. And my parents, if they were able to get an EV, and they may one day, um, would be a vehicle to grid system so that they can get the most out of the, the battery as, as an asset for helping the grid and get cheap energy as a result. So for different people, different profiles of, of charging um, and different solutions will be the way, of the, the way of the world. So there's no such thing as everyone will want and there's no such thing as no one will want all these things, all the solutions uh, in terms of where people might want to charge will have a role for somebody out there uh, to suit their individual needs. Uh, and from a grid point of view, diversity is king. The grid does not want, it will be a very expensive grid to try and to, to build and, and maintain if we if everybody just put, you know, plugs the car in in the evening and charges at peak time. It will put a huge amount of cost onto the cost of the, the infrastructure in the UK and, and it will um, ultimately increase energy costs for everybody. Uh, so diversity and spreading, spreading charging around around different places, different times, different rates, some trickle, some rapid to suit, the, to, to, to suit everybody uh, in a win-win way is absolutely the right thing in terms of keeping the necessary cost down for everybody, both in terms of ultimately infrastructure and, and cost of running vehicles. Um, and there are known charging preferences. Um, numerous surveys have shown that people's first preference is they want to charge at home if they can. Two thirds of people have got off-road parking. Uh, at work parking is very popular, a very, very desirable thing. Parking, uh, charging at supermarkets, so you're in there for 20, 25 minutes. That's perfect for a rapid charge. Cinema would be two, two and a half hours. That could be a sort of intermediate charge. So having ch the ability to charge uh, when you go to the cinema, for example, uh, is the sort of thing that would work. And, and there is now a network of charges, rapid charges on um, across the whole of the UK motorway network. And I only know of one um, motorway services. I think it's on the M5 and I forget which side it is. Um, there's one, I think only that hasn't got rapids yet. Um, but other than that, one location I can think of everywhere I've been and everywhere that I know of on the motorway network. All motorway services now have got rapids. And I, and having used, you know, a number of them in the last few months, um, I've never had to queue. There's always been space and they've always been functional. Public charging infrastructure is is something that um, is obviously needs needs to grow and continue to grow to match the volume of vehicles on the road and the need. Uh, there are over 12,500 locations uh, of publicly accessible charging points in the UK, which is now more than there are uh, conventional petrol and diesel filling stations. Um, and even in the last 30 days, this is this is up to date. This is a screenshot from this morning. Uh, there have been 384 new ch new charging points, public charging points installed in the last 30 days. And the definitive source for it all, you'll see the word ZapMap there, is a fantastic resource 
that you can zoom in and out of. You can put your postcode in. You can see what's what's available locally in terms of charging infrastructure, um, and you can use it to navigate and and plan routes. Uh, and it will help work out what which charging points would be available for you and in which parts of a route you might want to do. So if you're away from home charging, this is a fabulous resource and it really makes life fantastically uh, easy and useful um, for uh, EV and plug-in users. Um, and there has been a lot of investment, in, you know, just showing a different way here, in, in the last uh, year, 18 months, a significant investment in additional um, EV charging. Uh, infrastructure uh, beyond the need, I would say, at the moment. Uh, when it's needed because uh, it will help encourage people to drive, uh, buy and drive EVs. Um, uh, but the, you can see there the blue are sort of in intermediate levels of charging, which are still uh, a decent decent level of charge rate. Uh, the pink are the the real holy grail ones, are the, the rapids. Uh, and there's a significant, been a significant growth of those in the last couple of years. Um, which you, you, you really feel when you're out and about. And the only place I found it a bit difficult was in a, a sort of holiday trip to North Wales uh, in the early part of the year where it, there, you know, there weren't many about. And we did have to plan it very carefully. But if you're anywhere in, in England, there's, the, there, um, there's, there's, a, there's a significant um, density of them and, and plenty for most purposes, I would say, at the moment. Um, in terms of new developments on technology, I mentioned the, the sort of comparison with mobile phones earlier on. Um, there's a significant amount of money, effort, and patents going into new battery development to improve energy density, to improve life, to improve charging time, to reduce weight. Huge amount of effort worldwide, um, including in Japan with the battery manufacturers there. So we, we really are at the dawn of time in terms of what the technology will be able to do for us. Um, there are a lot of trials and, and very positive trials in terms of how they're going on smart charging. So this is where your, your car, you're, you're encouraged to charge at certain times where you're incentivized through pricing mechanisms to, to charge you know, in the middle of the night, like storage heaters um, uh, uh, are used in, in domestic heating uh, and at different times of day when energy is plentiful or um, more costly when energy is scarce. Um, and there's also, you know, the UK is a world leader in, in doing things like a vehicle to grid where you can actually sell your energy from your car or your electric vehicle back to the grid and make money out of it uh, and reduce costs even further. So the, the technology uh, domain is, is rapidly changing and the UK really is one of the leaders in terms of um, uh, the, the way in, in uh, the, the smarter use of vehicles and smarter use of energy. So on to a few myths. Um, certainly, so, so range, range anxiety. Um, the average miles per day a UK, a UK driver or UK car drives um, is a lot less than many people may think. So it's actually only 22. So if you do the, the straightforward maths, uh, the average UK car only does that per per day, which from an EV point of view is is you know, it's a walk in the park. It's 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 easy. Uh, it's well within the capabilities of any EV on the market. Um, so I hear people say, "Oh, I, I wouldn't really be comfortable getting one, getting an EV, unless it could do 200 miles." Well, um, really? Why? You know, my 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 day to day range is 130, 140 miles. We've been all over the UK in it. Yeah, we've had to use rapid charging occasionally. Um, but I would say uh, for most of the people I know, an EV uh, for most purposes is absolutely the right vehicle and will save people money and um, is, is a, a, a better car to drive ultimately. So I think the, the thing about range anxiety is, is uh, misplaced, I think, now, given uh, where we currently are with range of electric vehicles at the moment. It's, it's, they are very capable vehicles for most purposes, for most people. Um, another myth is that you know EVs are powered by coal-fired power stations, and uh, these are myths that have been uh, you know put out there and behind the scenes by the fossil fuel industry. Perhaps um, it's it's absolutely not the case. The UK hardly burns any coal anyway. Anyway, we're more than fifty percent renewables. Um, so this this really is a very very mis misplaced myth. Um, and these charts, uh, I'm. Apologies if they're a bit busy, but they give a comparison between the carbon footprint uh, uh, over the life of uh, an EV in different countries compared to a diesel car. So that left-hand bar chart there shows the average uh, grams per kilometer over the life of a vehicle, including making the vehicle, 
of a diesel car. Um, so it's over 200, um, where the purple is the, the fuel use. EVs do, do require more energy to make them. The battery is quite energy intensive to make. And then it compares based on the energy mix in each of those countries, um, how, uh, how the, an e, a, a typical, in inverted commas, EV fares in terms of the, the whole the whole life uh, carbon impact of, of an EV compared to a conventional vehicle, conventional diesel vehicle. Uh, Poland is a very coal-centered power system, so most of the coal in, in Poland is generated from coal, which is why Poland fares very badly. If you look over to the right-hand side, France is mostly nuclear, more than 80% nuclear energy. So um, that's why the the, 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 the use of a, the ownership of an EV in France is so good, and Sweden's got lots of hydro. And you can see the UK, which I put in there with the green, the uh, the um, union flag. Uh, as a comparator, because it for some reason it wasn't on this chart, we're in a pretty good place, and and we are only getting better because the the uh, carbon intensity of our electricity is reducing. We're gradually moving to more wind. Uh, we're almost off coal, um, and, uh, and and gas is is you know, going to be progressively coming down. So it will only get better. So uh, that particular myth about uh, the carbon um, uh, sensibility, if you like, of using an EV uh, is is nonsense. So vehicle cost, um, so the ZapMap site uh, is partnered with a site called Next Green Car, which is extremely good. Uh, where you can go and say, uh, this is my current vehicle, this is the vehicle I'm thinking of, or EV I'm thinking of buying. And it will, base on, based on some, some reasonable assumptions, make some comparisons of the cost of buying the car, new at this point in time, um, versus running costs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the, the cost of a new, new EV actually isn't very different to its equivalent petrol diesel counterpart in terms of the the purchase or ticket price um, the monthly or weekly or monthly running costs are significantly lower uh, and based on the calculations i did here a few a uh, few weeks ago um if you take the uh, if you were to buy a nissan leaf instead of a nissan, nissan Qashqai, uh within two and a half years you'd have you know you'd have recouped any extra extra investment in the vehicle uh, and then you'd be into um you know uh, cost saving for the long term and but ultimately the, the cost of these two, two new vehicles is very similar most people buy monthly anyway when they buy new um so uh, the, the, the 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 it's like reputation of evs being expensive partly driven by tesla uh is misplaced also they certainly uh, if you look at the whole life and the whole use cost uh, they are they are cheaper to run, uh, and that's and, and there are many fag packet calculations out there on on Facebook in particular forums that people say no, it is it is cheaper than the petrol car I was running before. Um, and for second hand cars, I don't buy I don't buy the price issue being a, a problem either. So if you were to buy uh, an older Renault Zoe, um, this was straight off Motors.co.uk a few weeks back. Uh, this is a Renault Zoe, and and that's what you would pay per month if you bought it on finance, or if you bought it outright, you could pay eight and a half k for it. So it's a relatively affordable, very very good, very highly rated EV. Uh, if you compare that on the same site the same day, I did a search for a Vauxhall Corsa um, with much the same mileage, same size car, um, much lower running costs, but the um, monthly actually is a bit more for some reason on the Corsa. But the ticket price is the same. You know, so you've got two cars there that are small five-door hatchbacks, um, and people are uh, still choosing, in, in general terms, to buy the petrol, diesel, and actually uh, the electric equivalent is actually really, really affordable. Um, another, uh, you know, criticism of EVs that you know the, the battery technology does use um, you know, lithium-ion and cobalt and and rare earth metals. Yes, they do. Um, but you know the the exploitation of natural resources around the world for many many reasons uh, is 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 you know clearly uh, uh, uncomfortable when you see what what does go on. Um, but for from you know there are many reasons other than cobalt or or copper or or uh, or some of the other precious metals that that uh, there are exploitation reasons such as child exploitation. So there are. Uh, there's, there's nothing unique about the EV sector from that point of view in that, yes, it wants something rare. Yes, that, that may be in a third world country. But I have to say that the auto manufacturers all trade uh, on reputation. You know, look at the effect of Dieselgate. 
um, VW. So reputation is hugely important to the automotive industry. So ensuring that the resources that are used ultimately mined that they're going to EVs are responsibly sourced will actually be, you know, is actually being very responsibly approached by the automotive sector. They work really, really hard to make sure that um, that they aren't tarred with any evidence, any credible evidence that that that, uh, that there are people or children being exploited to to extract these these minerals and metals and so on. Um, so I think that's that's something that's very very much a unique thing about the automotive sector is it wants that traceability back to source. Whereas, you know, some of the other sectors on there, such as the oil, oil industry, uh, diamonds, gold, you know, these are sort of, you know, um, much more established and much more difficult, um, much more complicated uh, supply chains. And, and I don't think there is that same degree of responsibility um, right through from end use and customer through to, to, to the natural resources. So I think, uh, I don't think people should feel uh, uncomfortable from um, from this point of view when they're buying or considering buying an EV or a plug-in vehicle. Um, another criticism, and certainly in the earlier days uh, that was thrown at EVs, is that the battery will only last about three years. You know, if you use it every day and you charge it every day, uh, there are only you know lithium-ion only works for a thousand cycles. So that's that's not the case. Uh, the, the batteries have proven to be much more robust than people expected and more robust actually even than the auto manufacturers expected. You know, Nissan are quietly pretty chuffed with how durable the, the batteries on the Nissan Leaf are. So there are, there's, a, there's a taxi firm in, in Cornwall um, that uh, clearly was in the, in the media here a while about having done 150,000 on the taxi. Yes, its range had decreased a bit through usage and age. Um, but uh, they've got fantastic use out of it at, at uh, you know, great saving. And there are there are other taxi fleets in the UK. There's one in Blackpool. Um, there's one in Lincolnshire, I think I saw last year. So um, the durability, durability of these batteries is is actually pretty impressive um, and, and uh, uh, very much approaching the life of what people would expect for the life of the vehicle. Um, another concern thrown at the sector is aren't we just going to create massive problems at the end of the vehicle life yes yeah, so you know 10 12 years time my car will have a reduced range on the battery it will maybe only have half of the capacity that it had at the beginning um, but then there is a, a new what they call a second life for that battery which will be in storage static storage locations uh, either in homes or in in purpose-built facilities around the power grid to enable the grid to balance uh, intermittent uh, supply and demand of renewables, et cetera, et cetera. And there are already companies in the UK um, who will take a, you know, a, a, a battery from an EV uh, uh, and, and put it into, into people's homes um, or into rapid charging facilities to, to support rapid charging locally. So there will be a life of maybe another 10 years of, um, of an EV battery. And then beyond that, they will be recycled through purpose-built uh, facilities and, and there was one announced just the other day in Birmingham actually that it's, it's setting up and gearing up to recycle EV batteries. So the life of an EV battery will perhaps be 20 years, um, which is pretty impressive. So that, that concern I don't think is a valid one either. Uh, near the end now. Um, and then the other uh, concern that also gets thrown at EVs is sometimes um, is, is that the power grid will never cope. Um, well, a couple of statistics here. Um, over the last 12, 14 years or so, the amount of uh, power, as in electricity, we use as a nation has gone down uh, by 10 to 12 um, percent over the last 12 or so years. Um, if you were to electrify all of the passenger vehicle fleet, uh, the current fleet of 30 million vehicles, if, if they were all to switch to being electric now, immediately, that would uh, put a burden on the grid of about another 10 or 11%. So we've we've saved 10 or 11% through, you know, more efficient computers and LED light bulbs and LED street lighting and all that sort of stuff. Um, um, and and there is, so there is capacity in the physical infrastructure for, uh, for, for, for distributing that energy around the country. Um, and we, you know, we have a growing, slowly growing demand of, of another 10 or 11 percent to to feed uh, EVs in the next uh, decade or 15 or 20 years, which will take up that capacity. 
Uh, we need more capacity as well, of course, because we're going to electrify other things in the UK. Uh, the capacity isn't, isn't always in the right place, and we do have uh, you know, nuclear power stations shutting down in the next decade or so. So there are issues around grid capacity as a whole, which uh, are you know, very robustly planned within government and within national grid. So um, I am completely confident, and national grid are completely confident, that we absolutely do not need to worry about the power grid coping with the the rise of EVs. It is not something we should worry about. Uh, it is being very professionally managed, in my view, in terms of planning that capacity, which was, to a certain extent does exist already because of the reduction in, in electricity use over the last uh, decade or more. So uh, that, just one other slide before I finish, and that's just to say that this, this talk is, is um, one of a few I have done or I'm happy to do uh, on, on, on or around decarbonization. Um, very happy to reach out to any audience to do stuff on uh, you know, the UK and how it's doing, you know, where to get information from, wh which are the most credible sources of, of, of information, and how to keep positive in this environment, because you know, decarbonization is a pretty gloomy agenda in many ways. Um, how we uh, are going to completely decarbonize our electricity because it's, it's only 50% of the way there at the moment. Uh, and then also talks I could do on, on low carbon homes and how to uh, retrofit technologies or what the, the real world outlook looks like in terms of decarbonization of homes and buildings. Um, and then there are other areas I'm very happy to do talks on, on other transport modes, you know, rail, uh, heavy freight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then there's heavy industry. You know, we, the UK has a very um, a, a big challenge with how to decarbonize um, heavy industry, steel, coal, sorry, steel, steel, uh, paper, uh, mm -hmm. food industry, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm um, very happy to to do similar talks to to anyone on any of those subjects. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we have a whole raft of questions. Um, yeah, there's one from Steve Carpenter says, surely power distribution to homes in a typical street would struggle to cope with everyone charging at 10 kilowatts overnight. Okay. And, yeah, then look to the future when all homes will be electrically heated rather than gas, there'll be grid meltdown. Yeah. So um, the maximum you can charge at home is 6.6 .6 kilowatts. Uh, instantly, we charge at 2.2. .2. We trickle off a three pin plug because that's all we need. Um, so the most an individual home could charge would be 6.6, .6, which is less than an electric shower. Okay, it's on for longer. Um, the distribution network operators who I know very well, because I worked very close with, closely with them in my last job before I retired, um, have done extensive trials to understand which local distribution networks are, are most at risk from EV present penetration. Um, real world use of EVs, real world charging, the implementation of smart charging that I talked about earlier. Because um, if, you know, our, our use at home is, uh, you know, we do, we probably do 22 miles a day on average. We probably do about the average, um, you know, plugged in on 6.6 .6 kilowatts. That's about an hour to charge our car for our average daily use. So the trials that have been done to date uh, show that the the way people use their cars um, in terms of when they want to use them and charge them in real world scenarios on large scale trials um, have given them in, invaluable data, data that shows that uh, we're actually in a pretty good place um, and have shown help the, help the networks understand where they need to reinforce in advance of need. Um, and in my own street, you know, there are three or four plug-in vehicles out of a home, out of a home street of about 25 vehicles, sorry, 20, yeah, 25 homes. Um, there's a couple of EVs and there's a couple of plug-in hybrids. Um, and I was in touch about my own, with my own distribution network operator about this. And I said, you know, for my particular road, and he did look at my particular road because, um, he, he knew what I do. He, he said, no, you, you, there's plenty of bandwidth there for, for more. Um, indeed, yes, when we move to electrification of heat, the, the whole of the grid will, to a certain extent, need upgrading if we, if we do move to mass electrification uh, through heat pumps. Uh, that's assuming we don't move to a hydrogen-based um, um, infrastructure for heating homes. So if we go to heat pumps, which is pretty challenging, but we'll, we'll, we'll be, you know, 10 or 20 years or 30 years to roll out, uh, we will need uh, grid in, uh, grid reinforcement for that. 
Um, but the network operators uh, are very tuned into this and they've been doing trials in all these sorts of areas, heat pumps and EVs for the last uh, seven, eight, nine years uh, on and off um, in, in different depths of, of um, sophistication. Okay, next question. I hope that answers that one. Um, how much does a battery cost to replace? Um, nobody really knows because very few have been replaced. Um, the I think to my, my, my understanding of talking to Nissan, because I have a, an insider in Nissan and the engineering side, uh, is that there are about, we think there are three that have been replaced worldwide because there was a defect with them. Um, the cost of them is high. It's at the moment, uh, I think it's six or seven thousand pounds. Um, you know, if you've got a two, three-year-old petrol diesel car and the and the engine is uh, the engine blows up, you're probably faced with a two or three thousand pound bill. If you want to have something reasonably reasonably comparable installed, um, but the the bottom line is that they are phenomenally reliable and replacements are extremely rare. Um, and the warranty on them is seven years in most manufacturers cases anyway. So, um, people don't regard that as an issue. It's a whole okay. people, people who've, who've, who've got an EV and, and can, can see all those statistics and, you know, have heard all that evidence. And... Okay. Next question from Celia. The silent car is a danger to blind people. EVs are supposed to have some sound added, aren't they? They do, yes. Yeah. So as of, um, I think it's from early last year, uh, they all have to make a noise at the front. Uh, Nissan Leafs have always done so. So below 30 miles an hour, my car has got a, a little sort of tw twittering high-pitched noise, which you can hear when you're driving the car. And you can, obviously you can, you can hear it in front of the car and you can still hear it a bit from the driving position. Uh, so they all have to do that by law across Europe. Um, I would also say that most modern petrol cars in particular at low speed, say 20 miles an hour, are really, really quiet. You know, the automotive manufacturers have seen EVs coming um, and they work really hard to make them as quiet as they possibly can to make the driving experience as as close to an EV as they can. So if you are in you know, on, on the pavement and you will, particularly for larger petrol cars, you will barely hear them. You'll, it'll be the tire noise that you'll hear. So I would actually argue that even those cars should have an audible noise at, at low speeds because uh, I think they are really very, very uh, indistinguishable from an EV in terms of noise at those at those low, those sort of pedestrian speeds. Okay, from Andrew, what home charging setup do you have? Okay, so um, I've got. How much yeah. do they cost to have installed? And is there a restriction if you only have a 60 amp supply to your house? Okay. Um, so we have a 60 amp supply, or we did have till very recently. So we run with the 60 amp supply for six years with a 3.3 kilowatt charger. Um, we've upgraded to a 6.6 .6 for our newer car, um, which we would have been all right with it, actually. We didn't need to upgrade, but we chose to. Um, and we upgraded to, we actually managed to upgrade to 100, the 1950s house. Um, but we would have got by, I think, with just the 6.6, .6, with, without the, with the 60, because we don't have electric showers. Um, and installing them is, uh, there is a government grant, which uh, means this cost of install is around about 300, I think. 300, 350, something like that. Um, so we so we charge it's we, we can charge at 6.6 .6, so we have a 6.6 .6 charger on the wall um which we very rarely use um we actually just just because of where it is and where we like to park the cars and drive we actually charge 99 percent of our home charging at 2.2 kilowatts which is really slow it you know takes overnight to charge the battery to completely full but that's absolutely fine for us and that's ultimately better for the battery the slower you, slower you charge the better for the battery as a general rule um so uh that's how that's how we're configured at home and 6.6 .6 is the most you would ever have at home there are odd people who seem to want to 22 kilowatts at home but I, I don't think many people will actually do that and in norway people are all charging at 6.6 .6 and and you know, nobody bothers no no one's trying to charge it higher okay so from steve field without massively extending the mileage per charge 
or drastically shortening charging time, how will hundreds of thousands of people, some needing to charge more than once, reach their destination on a busy holiday weekend? So this is where the, the growth of the public charging infrastructure needs to obviously continue. Um, it's meeting demand, I would say, in, in general terms, it's, it's, it's more than meeting demand in terms of the availability of charging points. So as time moves on, you will see rows and rows and rows of EV charging points. So I was at a services on the M6, I think it was Hilton Park, um, the other day, and there was a row of about, I don't know, a dozen or 15 Tesla charging points, um, and there was only one Tesla plugged in there so we will gradually see uh, a greater uh, penetration of, of numbers of charges so and, and in time you will be able to book it ahead uh, or the car will do it automatically for you um, and and, and uh, so the sophistication of the experience will will improve uh, in time as well but so really it's just you know supply needs to match demand so uh, supply is is in most cases, I would say, just a little bit ahead of demand at the moment, certainly from the motorway charging network's point of view, in my experience. And as long as it keeps to do that and the infrastructure keeps being built out, then then what, you know, I don't, I don't, know, the, you, I don't know what the problem would be. Okay, um, from Steve Carpenter. How does your phone communicate with your car? Bluetooth or 4G at a price? The, the, the car's got a, a 4G, I guess. It's got a SIM card somewhere in it. Um, doesn't cost me anything. It came with a car. Um, so I just use an app on the phone and just log into the car and I can see what temperature the car's at inside. I can turn the heating on and off. Uh, I can set a charge timer from my, my app on my phone. Uh, I get a notification when the charging's finished. Um, what else can I do? I think that's it on mine. There's, there are some man manufacturers who've got much more sophisticated features than that. Uh, I suspect that you know it's, it's an opportunity for the uh, the higher end models to um, or brands to to really go to town on what you can turn on and off remotely. Okay, and this is a question from me on the back of that. Have yep. you changed the default passwords on that? Because I know I've read all sorts of things about cars being hijacked, not just electric ones. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I have a wife that insists I do that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, I, I do. I don't have the default one. I mean, you can't control the car in terms of driving it or stealing it through that app. It's a very benign app uh, in terms of its functionality. Um, but but I, I, I know what line of work you're in, so don't worry. I, I understand why you've asked the question and, and uh, fair question to ask. Yeah. And how long do the batteries last before they might need to be replaced? I think you've half answered that, but it's probably yeah. Right. So, so the annual degradation is really there are there are a number of factors that make that, that re reduce the life of the, or the capacity of the battery. Uh, one is uh, time. Um, so you know, in, in that, and that's partly temperature dependent as well. So you're looking at one to two percent on an annual basis fall off in battery capacity my car's uh three coming up three years old and i wouldn't say it's any different from you i didn't have it from you but actually it very much seems to be giving me the range that it would have been new um so time is one factor and you can't do anything about that so that just a, there's a gradual tapering off of, of battery capacity year year by year of sort of one to two percent i think it's something something in those regions but you can you can mitigate the, the, the life of the battery and improve its life through how you use it. If you leave it full, charged full, um, for long periods of time, for, well, for time, uh, that reduce, reduces its capacity. It doesn't like, like being sat full. Um, so uh, people who charge it when they get home and then it sits there fully charged from 10 o'clock at night through to 8 o'clock the following morning, that's not best practice. That's not ultimately that will ultimately contribute to the degradation of the battery a little bit only a small amount but little bits will add up um, and also being sat full and in heat in the sun does, doesn't do them any good they don't like that either so avoid leaving them fully charged in the sun if you if you leave your mobile phone in a sunny window fully charged its battery will degrade quite quick you know more quickly than it might have otherwise um, they don't like uh, being driven um, below 10 percent capacity uh, particularly driven hard so when you when you're down into the bottom of the tank as it were you know be gentle with it 
um, and, and you will help improve the, the age of the battery, the life of the battery. So there's, there's no exact answer for this. So, uh, and, and also we, we, as I say, we slow charge at home because the slower you charge, the less heat you're putting into the battery when you're charging, and the less heat you're putting into it, the, the less uh, you are um, affecting its chemical processes and its de the degradation of materials that de degrade and so on. So heat, heat and staying away from anything that puts heat into the battery is good. Um, and, and, and rapid charging, you know, they are pretty robust from the point of view of taking lots of rapid charges. So all these taxi companies use rapid charges twice a day um, and still get pretty good battery life. So, so, but as a general rule, I only rapid charge if I need to. Uh, if I do rapid charge, I don't worry about it because it, it will only make a small, very small difference to the life of the battery. Um, but it's just as a general housekeeping. I don't because I, I just want to look after and, and, and polish polish the life of my battery out as long as I can. Um, so I hope that's of help. So in terms of the, the lifetime, it's, it's very hard to answer uh, definitively, but it could be anywhere between eight, nine years for a battery that's that's had a hard life and it hasn't has had someone that doesn't care about it through to 10 12 14 years for re for reasonable life but it will be it will be less with time uh, but still very usable vehicle in time okay and i think now we have the last question which is another one from celia is it possible the world will run out of the raw materials for the batteries okay so the un um have done a lot of sorry is it, I might, no it might not be the un I thought it was the UN. Um, there's been a lot of um, ah. research, there's been a lot of research done into this, um, and if it wasn't the UN, I can't think of it was. Um, but so apologies for that. Uh, and 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 there's there's really strong evidence that there are there are there are no limitations to lithium. Um, really, uh, the resources are out there, um, and you know the the mining sector is really clever at finding new resources. Anyway. Um, you've only got to look at there are 60 or, seven, 60 or 70 precious metals in a mobile phone and nobody worries about that. I mean, the one that does the screen bit where you can touch it and, and do clever things with your finger on touching it, that, that's, a, that's a material that they reckon there's only 10 years of it left. Um, nobody worries about that. Um, so I, I think um, that the life of materials is, is also going to be helped by the massive amount of research and development going on by the battery manufacturers and, and technology developers who are they're all looking for ways of, you know, re reducing the amount of cobalt, trying to find ways of eliminating cobalt, trying to find ways of, of uh, using more available materials. So um, where we are now is very different to where we'll be in terms of the battery chemistries and, and the, the, the reliance on stuff that's hard to dig out of the ground or hard to find. OK, I hate to do this, but Steve Carpenter's just sneaked in with another question that that's I fine. would actually like the answer to. And it says... I tend to think hybrid are the worst of both worlds, owing to complexity and therefore service cost. Yes, that's a good nod. Yes. Are there comparison tables for the total cost of ownership over, say, 10 years at 10K mile, miles per year? I haven't seen one. Um, and it would depend on your vehicle use. I mean, I knew someone who had a plug-in hybrid who, who did everything he possibly could to charge off the wall and get his energy off the wall. And he almost never used petrol. Uh, and in his case, he's obviously got the lowest per mile costs from an, a fuel point, an energy point of view, but he's still paying for annual servicing of you know, the, the conventional stuff. So yeah, in, in some respects, it is the worst of both worlds. Um, uh, so it very much depends on usage. I mean, if you're a caravan user, if you're a caravan owner, I was, uh, there isn't anything now that can tow a caravan at the moment in terms of battery vehicle other than the Tesla Model X, which no one can really afford, uh, and it will still hammer the range. So you can't really practically tow a caravan with an EV, but you could with a plug-in hybrid. So the out Mitsubishi Outlander is is rated as a very good tow car. So that, that's a halfway house solution until battery electric vehicles and uh, have got the uh, capacity to sensibly tow a caravan, for example. But yes, they are, they are the world's worst. You, you're carrying around more weight than you need because you've got two of everything. You've got a complete conventional driveline and you've got all your battery stuff as well. And you've got um, you've got all of the conventional serving co servicing costs as well. And you're not saving anything on servicing um, either. So yeah, it, it is a bit of a fudge, but it's a transition. It gets people into, into, the, into an EV type experience um, and, and it gamifies it for people who, who want to try and, you know, avoid using the petrol engine uh, and people find it fun 
So, um, yeah, he's, he's absolutely right. I'm on the same page as him. Okay. Well, thank you very much for Mark. Uh, for that, Mark. Uh, I think we've come to an end now, so we will wrap up. But for the benefits of anybody watching, if there's anything you want to re-watch, it will be available on Crowdcast for a short while. I will be uh, downloading the video, I will be editing it, and we will be making it available on our YouTube channel. And this particular one will be available to all U3As. And I know that we've had representatives from at least four different U3As watching us this morning, which is great. So, and you've, this is the second time I've seen this talk. First time was with my husband. And more importantly than anything else, you've convinced my husband that we should get an electric car. Yes. <laughs> I've thought so for ages. But, but yes, yes. So I'm going to let him watch this because I just wish I could. I just wish I could convince the rest of my family. My brother's just changed his his wife's car, um, you know, for a thirty mile commute, and they bought a two year old petrol car. I just yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much, and um, bye bye, everybody. Thank you. thank you for the questions as well. Great stuff. So I hope you found that talk uh, engaging, informative, uh, and enjoyable. Um, try to put a bit of fun into it where I can. Um, if you have any questions that come to mind that aren't covered by the Q&A after this part of the video, then please do get in touch. My contact information is below. Um, and also I've, I've done talks in a number of other areas on uh, the climate change agenda. Uh, and, and here in front of you is a list of, of talks I either have done or I'd be very happy to put together for uh, any any sort of particular audience or in combinations of the of the following so the, the first sort of subject area that i can cover uh, is is you know where is the uk uh, both in its in its uh, path to it to to achieving its own climate change goals but also compared to other countries where the challenges are uh, where we might actually be doing well uh, second subject area is um, where you can find sources of impartial, straightforward information on this whole agenda. Um, third one, how to keep positive. Um, this is a really daunting, sobering agenda at times. Um, it really, it really is. We really are up against it, um, and you know, how to keep positive in the face of that is is a challenge. Uh, fourth area, uh, one around electricity and our power system we are you know just just past 50 percent now in terms of decarbonizing our electricity generation but how might we actually achieve the other 50 percent and reach 100 percent um what does the future look like in terms of how we use energy smart systems smart grids the use of energy storage in our in our energy system so on where does all that fit in and what might things look like in the next decade or two um, to help us achieve uh, a fully decarbonized electricity generation um, system, especially in light of increasing demand for electricity with um, electri electrification of transport and heating in buildings. Uh, and that brings me on to the fifth subject area, which is decarbonizing heat in homes. How are we really going to move away from heating with gas, oil, um uh, lpg uh, coal in some cases um and and how, how are we going to move away and decarbonize homes um which is a significant significant challenge and, and probably one of the most difficult nuts to crack in decarbonization for the uk um, other modes of transport we covered at evs today uh, but obviously there is um, uh, rail heavy heavy uh, road transport um, also, um the airline sector uh, and, and shipping as well, of course, maritime and how we might uh, achieve that and what the solutions are and the barriers there. And then lastly, the one sort of that sits behind the scenes from the public eye most of the time, which is the energy intensive industries, um, such as um, chemical processing, uh, paper industry, uh, cement manufacture, um, pharmaceuticals. There are a lot of very heavily, heavy energy users out there. Um, for whom decarbonisation is, is a major challenge because they have a huge reliance uh, in the main on gas. Uh, so, so you know, what does the future look like for 
um, decarbonizing those very, very tough industrial sectors. So contact information below. Feel free to get in touch anytime. Thank you.